Good morning. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the uh, opportunity to be here today to discuss the role of metastasectomy in patients with uh, kidney cancer. This is my disclosure. And this is the outline of the talk for the next 9 minutes and 46 seconds. I'm going to start simply with the epidemiology. And uh, as we know from the statistical papers that come every year, there's about 65,000 patients who will be diagnosed with kidney tumors. About 90% of those will have kidney cancer. And almost one-third of the patients will have synchronous metastases at diagnosis. And about 30 to 40% who are initially non-metastatic will develop what's considered to be metachronous um, metastases. So this is, there's a large number of patients who ultimately will have metastasis and need to be treated either by drugs or by surgery. There are several uh, challenges in patients with metastatic kidney cancer. The minority will respond to cytokine therapy. There are rare complete responses with targeted therapies, and the disease is typically not responsive to chemo or radiation. So I'm going to review very briefly a few retrospective studies that show some survival benefit for patients who undergo metastasectomy. This is the Cavolia study, one of the uh, uh, first and most cited papers on this topic from Memorial Sloan Kettering that showed that in patients who had complete metastasectomy, the five-year overall survival is about 44%. This is another paper from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Again, five-year survival if you've had any metastasectomy is about 49%. And this benefit was seen across the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering risk groups. This is a large multicenter European retrospective study. Again, show that if you've had any metastasectomy done, your five-year overall survival is 44%. And this is one of the more recent and uh, more thorough and uh, well-analyzed papers from the Mayo Group that showed if you do a complete metastasectomy, the five-year cancer-specific survival can be 45%. Let me go through a few metastatic uh, sites, and I'll start from the top and work my way down. The brain, we can do different uh, treatments, including surgical resection, stereotactic radiosurgery uh, for specific lesions, or whole brain irradiation for uh, patients with multiple brain meds. Unfortunately, these are associated with other metastases, and the overall survival is poor in this uh, particular patient population. However, there are some good prognostic factors if you have one brain metastasis, if it's supratentorial, and if you don't have any symptoms at the time of diagnosis. Uh, thyroid gland is another organ that can be affected by metastases, and metastasectomy is possible with a five-year overall survival of about 51% if uh, surgery is done. Lung, as you know, is the most common organ, and surgery can be anywhere from a simple wedge resection up to a pneumonectomy in selected patients. However, you certainly need good pulmonary function to have this kind of surgery, and a five-year overall survival in this group can be anywhere from 31 to 37%. A good uh, outcome can be achieved occasionally in patients who have a complete resection, who have a disease-free interval of two years or longer, and in the absence of mediastinal metastasis uh, in the lymph nodes, and in patients who have a small number of pulmonary metastasis. Unfortunately, liver is one of those organs who, in kidney cancer, if you have a metastasis in the liver, it's not a very good outcome. The two-year survival in one study was 56%. In another study, the median survival was uh, 16 months. However, you could have better outcomes if it's done with a curative intent, with a long disease-free interval, in smaller tumors with uh, normal laboratory values. Pancreas is one of those uh, organs uh, that actually have a good prognosis if metastases are discovered. And this is a very nice meta-analysis of over 300 patients that um, most of these patients, or two-thirds of them, had a solitary pancreatic metastasis. Most of these metastases are actually metachronous. They occur about 10 years after the nephrectomy. And surgery can be anywhere from a simple enucleation of the lesion to a distal pancreatectomy to all the way to a Whipple procedure in very selected patients. The five-year overall survival in patients who have pancreatic metastasis who undergo successful surgical resection can be over 70%. And the predictors of good outcome in this meta-analysis are if you have no extrapancreatic disease, so a solitary pancreatic metastasis, and if you have no symptoms related to the metastasis in the pancreas. Bone surgery uh, or metastasectomy can be done for different reasons. It could be done for patients who have no symptoms, but from the images, one can tell that there is an impending pathological fracture. So this is done prophylactically. It can also be done for symptomatic patients, either because of pain or neurological compromise. But it can also be done in very selected patients for curative intent without any symptoms or impending fracture. 
the five-year survival is poor in the majority of patients. However, the selection that we can use can improve the survival if the patient has one bone lesion, a long disease-free interval, and if surgery is done with a curative intent. Uh, the retroperitoneum is another organ where local recurrences can be uh, noted, and this could be anywhere from the adrenal gland to a fossa recurrence to lymph nodes, and this is a retrospective study on 54 patients, and this study noted five predictors of poor outcome. Uh, there were surgical margins if they're positive, if there's a sarcomatoid component, if the size was more than five centimeters, and if you have abnormal laboratory values uh, such as alkaline phosphatase and LDH. The survival, if you had none of these risk factors, was uh, 111 months, and if you have one, it was 40 months, and if you have two and more, it was uh, eight months. So the next four minutes, I'll talk about the integration of systemic therapy in metastasectomy. Uh, we talk about this more often in cytoreductive nephrectomy. I don't think we discuss it as much in this setting. And I'm going to introduce these new terms, uh, the pseudo-neoadjuvant therapy and the pseudo-adjuvant therapy. I promise I didn't make up these terms last night. These are terms that have, have been used in other cancers, such as colorectal, breast, and soft tissue sarcomas. The pseudo-neoadjuvant therapy is for a patient who had a metastasis. They have targeted therapy or immunotherapy, and then they have a metastasectomy. And the pseudo-adjuvant therapy is when patients have a metastasis, they then have a metastasectomy, they are NED, and then they have systemic therapy. So let me start with the pseudo-neoadjuvant. This is a retrospective study uh, on 38 patients who had immunotherapy, they had no progressive disease, and then they had metastasectomy. 76% so had a complete resection, and 90% had additional pseudoadjuvant therapy. The median time to progression was almost two years, the median survival was almost five years, and eight patients were NED at the last follow-up. And in this retrospective study, the predictors of good outcomes were being NED after surgery in those 76% of patients, and if a patient had a pulmonary metastasis. This is another study that used targeted therapy this time, another small study, retrospective, and the recurrence rate was half the patients had a recurrence, and nine of these patients did receive targeted therapy after the initial surgery, but the mean time off the targeted therapy was over a year. Survival for the uh, 21 out of the 22 patients were still alive at 25 months, or over two years. But uh, a word of caution, all this retrospective small study has shown that this is feasible, but it's certainly not a standard of care uh, when faced with these patients. Uh, the pseudo-adjuvant therapy, uh, I went to clinicaltrials.gov and found uh, three studies. One of these studies already was uh, briefly mentioned today by Dr. Haas, the last one on the right. And these are the identifiers here, uh, in case you need to look up more, some more information. The, these are all randomized, either phase two or phase three studies. The drugs are anywhere from serafinib to sunitinib to pizopinib in these studies. The metastasis uh, site can be uh, in any location or pulmonary only. And again, this is pseudoadjuvant. So patients had a metastasis, had metastasectomy, were NED, and then were randomized to either placebo or one of these drugs. Most of these were clear cell only and the primary endpoint as expected in this group was disease-free survival. Just some random thoughts when doing this talk. Uh, I think we need to better uh, select patients uh, as far as when we are faced with synchronous disease or metachronous disease. When do we pull the trigger and say, okay, you need a metastasectomy now? I don't think we know that very well yet and it's very subjective. Uh, can we use the pseudo-neoadjuvant therapy as a litmus test in this patient population to decide if we should proceed with metastasectomy or not? Um, what about metastasectomy in non-clear cell histology? And I think we should report the number of patients who have metastasectomy in phase three targeted therapies. When I looked at the seminal phase three trials, I could never find the word metastasectomy in those trials. Maybe they're having it and they're not reported, or maybe the patients aren't having metastasectomy. And an important question in our practice is how many patients are potentially eligible for metastasectomy and are not getting it? Maybe they're not being offered metastasectomy, maybe they're not eligible, but I think whenever we see a patient with a small number of metastases, we should always keep in the back of our mind not just serafinib, sunitinib, all the ibs, pezopinib, tevozinib, but maybe simple metastasectomy might cure the patient. And the question that um, I had is how many patients have solitary metastases in recent studies? Most of these studies uh, included patients with ECOG 3, uh, 0 or 1, 
and their good or intermediate risk, except the sunitinib open access uh, study because it included 7% of patients with brain meds, 13% uh, of patients with non-clear cell, and 13% of patients with poor risk. But if you look at these trials, anywhere from 14% to even 31% in the most recent trial have solitary metastasis. And this is, uh, these are numbers I got from table one and from supplementary tables from the papers. So up to potentially a third of patients have solitary metastasis, uh, but you can't find the word metastasectomy anywhere in that paper. So some take home messages. Um, metastasectomy is important in selected patients, not in every patient, of course, with kidney cancer, and we should consider it at least in patients who have good performance status, good surgical candidates, limited metastatic burden, a long disease-free interval, but we can also use it for palliative purposes in very selected patients, and it's ideal when complete resection is feasible, but it, there are some papers that show that even incomplete metastasectomy is better than no metastasectomy. I believe we need better tools to select the patients who are qualified for this type of surgery, and we should continue to study integration with systemic therapy. There are three pseudoadjuvant trials I mentioned, but there are no pseudo-neoadjuvant trials that are being done, and that's potentially something that can be explored. Thank you very much.